Hello, so I'm Alexis, I work at UCL, um, and this talk is primarily about the... Um, so we've just heard a lot of amazing, exciting things about what you can do with APIs and um, growth hacking, and you won't hear any of that here because basically we've just started using APIs at UCL in any real sense. So what I'm going to talk about is how we got to that point and why we decided that was the point we were going to go to. Um, so the talk is going to go through more about UCL than you probably ever wanted to know and then go into more detail about why we started doing a project to use APIs. Um, and having chosen WSO2 to do that, what we thought it would look like um, introducing the service. And once we decided what we thought it would look like, what it actually looked like for the first period um, going along there and some of the changes that we made along the way to get there a little bit faster. And now that we've got an API platform, which, spoiler alert, we do, um, what we think the next steps are for us and how we can um, get better use out of them and do things in a better way. So UCL uh, stands for University College London, which is us. We're London's global university. We've trademarked that. You can't steal that if you want it. Um, we were established about 200 years ago and we're the eighth um, eighth best university in the world by ranking. We're also the third largest university in the UK by student enrolment, but that was in 2017. I think since then we've overtaken Manchester, so we've got more students than Manchester University. And the number one university is the, uni um, the Open University. I don't think they count because they don't even have a campus. Um, to be the best, the biggest university in the UK, you need about 45,000 students. That's the number to beat. Um, and to support those 45,000 students, we've got about 15,000 staff. Half of those are academic staff actually doing the teaching, which means the other half are support professional services staff. Some of those in the centre um, and a lot of those embedded in departments. And the makeup of our universities, we've got that professional services um, centre, HR, finance, etc. Then we've got three schools, which are broken into 11 faculties, which are broken into 100 departments. And that's relevant because a lot of those departments and faculties weren't even part of UCL, even as recently as 10 years ago. They were completely independent, which means they have still a great identity of their own. And the reason that they were brought into UCL is because they were great at what they did. Our architecture school is the best in the world. We've got the number one um, education institute. Um, and so they've given a great deal of autonomy to continue to be that good, which means they can uh, spend their own money, they've got their own budget, which means they can do their own IT, which means a lot of the time we have to go cap in hand and out, out there and ask them to use our IT, and they can just say no if they want to. They don't have to do anything we tell them. Um, our IT department is ISD, um, the Information Service Division, and while we do have humble beginnings, we are on this map of the original ARPANET network. Um, I think we're here somewhere, London. Um, history books are divided as to whether or not Norway or London were the, was the first transatlantic node on ARPANET, but um, I think everybody agrees that UCL was the first, pers the first location to receive a transatlantic network packet. So we're kind of a big deal in the internet. Um, but having been a big part of the internet in London and in the world um, from the 70s means that you've got a lot that you're carrying with you. We still support a lot of institutions around London, the um, British Museum, the Royal Astronomical Society. We still provide them internet services and they're old institutions and they're not massively looking to change a lot of that core stuff, which means we still have to support it. And that support came from this original um, service provision was from one of our academic departments, the computer science department. It moved into a computer center, but we had other IT departments which merged only again in the last um, five to 10 years. And they brought with them their own bits of technology, which means we've got a lot of technical redundancies that we're um, supporting. We've got a lot of technical debt that as a public institution, which we kind of are, um, we don't always have the finances or the um, drive to change. And we've got lots of legacy things, systems, our ways of working. We're only just adopting Agile. So again, I'm not going to use a whole. When we looked at that graph before, I noticed us over there at the 4% of thinking about doing Agile. Um, and our organisational structure still has a lot of change that it needs to go through. We've introduced ITIL in the last few years. Um, and we've broken and reformed around services, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, but in the case of APIs and our use of APIs, ARPANET isn't necessarily where it all begins. So in, 19, in, the, in the 1560s, when they were first building those um, 
lonely, isolated wagon ways. Little did they know that a mere 449 years later, somebody would have the bright idea of bulldozing down Euston to create a new um, train link and destroying one of our data centers. Having decided that, we suddenly had to move all of our services out of um, Wolfson House as it was there. This is a, an image of us um, carving out part of Torrington Place by Tottenham Court Road to build a new data centre. Um, but this wasn't going to be our main base of operations. We actually moved all the way out to Sunny Slough, uh, where we've got a new shared data centre. But moving however many thousand virtual servers and however many hundred services and however many other bits of network kit that again have underpinned London for however long means a root and branch inventory of what it is that we're um, supporting and how it is that we're doing those things. And it just, I mean, when you've been doing IT um, as long as we have for the types of people we have with a team of 30 moving up to a team of 500, a lot of things just don't get touched for 30 years because they work at the moment and nobody knows why or how they work and therefore nobody goes near them. So the hidden complexities all came to the service. Those brittle integrations, we've got a DNS server which will go down if ever we turn off our homepage. Um, and that brings down DNS for about 15 institutions around London. And the legacy practices, again, the release cycles that we use, the uh, manual testing that we had to go through, realizing that if we turn off service X, service Y just sits there blank faced for, uh, until it gets turned back on. All of that got surfaced and it made us realize that we need to do things differently. And doing things differently at UCL meant a lot of changes. We're introducing DevOps, Agile, we're doing hybrid cloud work. There's lots of things that we're starting to introduce. And one of the first things that came out of, um, came after, or towards the end of Slough was a new HR system. And um, because we hadn't necessarily learned all our lessons, we went monolith again. We're getting a new massive Oracle um, Enterprise Business Suite application installed. But we thought we'll do at least a little bit of it differently. And rather than having, I think it was 50 point-to-point -point database integrations, we'll design some APIs around it. Um, and that seems easy enough. We know what APIs are. Everybody knows what the acronym is. You can find it on Wikipedia. We know what we've got at the moment. We've got um, a bunch of consuming applications out there around departments within our own IT department, which are connecting to our various um, backend relational database management systems. We've got a lot of Oracle. We've got some um, SQL servers, some MySQL, or SQL server, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, we've got a lot of data stored in those um, backend data sources being consumed by a range of different applications, be it PHP, Java, um, various bits of .NET, some old forms and reports. We've got that. We know that. And we know what we're trying to do in parallel. We're trying to standardize our code repositories, um, come around to a particular way of doing version control. We're trying to automate our deployment more. We're trying to automate our testing more. We're trying to get to that pipeline. We're not quite there yet, but we're going to have DevOps up and running any day now. Um, and so we know what the gap is. We need an API layer that we can use to integrate these two things, the consuming applications and the um, data sources, and that can integrate with a pipeline and with um, new ways of doing or more standard ways of doing um, version control. So we need an access point. We need a place that these consuming applications can go to call the APIs. We need some data translation. We've got a whole bunch of legacy applications which are using their own terminology. We want to wrap all of that in a canonical data model, we have some conceptual data models um, on top of it. So we need to translate the terminology that those backend systems are using into the business-friendly language that's going to stick around for a lot longer. We need some database connectors. We don't want to have to write a whole bunch of um, application code every time we need to access those databases. So we want something that plugs straight in. We can write some queries, and that gets pulled. And all the hard work of turning it into usable data is done for us. We want to wrap all of that in authentication. At the moment, we've got some schema names. We've got some passwords hidden in flat files somewhere that are easy to, no, they're not easy to crack. They're very secure, so don't go looking for them. But um, we know we need to do things differently. We need better authentication. We need to know who's calling what, and we need to know what data they're accessing, rather than just a schema getting access to all the tables. And then once we've got all of that, and we've got our APIs, and they're sitting there all lovely and secure, all um, standardized. We need a place for someone to go, decide which API they want, and call it down, subscribe to it. Um, so all of that, nice and simple, bish, bash, bosh, uh, lots of happy faces, mostly in the IT department. Um, but of course, the staff will be happy, and then ultimately the students will be happy. Um, so a couple of weeks work. Ah, no. Turns out, 
Um, and if you see anybody who was involved in the um, early days of that project, maybe don't mention Puppet to them because all of those things I mentioned before, all of the things that we had problems with when we moved our technology out of our now demolished data center still existed. We're still doing those things. Those things are still a problem. And they're a problem for all, really, our supposedly turnkey solutions. We've still got a whole bunch of firewall rules that are stopping people from connecting to things that are hiding servers that only allow certain ports so we don't know why, certificates that have particular rules around generation. We've got our various 2.7 versions of Puppet, old versions, old versions that use slightly newer um, methodologies. We're trying to rationalize all of those into an entirely new version, but all three are running at the same time. And different services have got different versions of Puppet running on them. We've got our operating system management, so we do particular types of package management. And all of that's very necessary for our thousands of servers, which are currently on a street going up to Slough. But it does add a layer of complexity when anybody tries to install something new. And we've got our minimum two identity servers, uh, identity services. So multiple identities are always going to be a problem for us. But despite that, despite all of these complexities, despite the many roadblocks that came in the way of our year one, we got something delivered. The HR project that needed it got something. Everybody was happy. We managed to bulldoze through a whole bunch of those problems through a, a whole lot of work. Um, and even though they've managed to deliver something which frankly amazing given the constraints they had, I think they're going to carry the scars of it for a very long time. <sighs> So, take a breath. We've done year one. We've learned all those lessons. We've got our um, installation done. So the next year is going to be easy because we've learned those lessons now. It's all going to be just extend them, just move them onto a slightly better set of um, hardware. What we actually delivered in year one was very simple. It was the, um, I don't know how familiar people are with the uh, components that come with WSO2, but we had the all-in-one API manager, which was doing our gateway, which has got basic co-auth involved in it, and also gives you the storefront and the publisher. And we had Enterprise Integrator, which does um, the connection to the database, pulls the data out, transforms it into a usable API, and then allows you to do transformations before it's consumed and managed by the API manager. In year two, all it needed to do was just extend that a little bit. We wanted to add a little bit more complexity or add a bit more capability to it and add a little bit more performance and resilience. So we moved from having a single all-in-one um, gateway and marketplace to having separately a gateway and a marketplace. Um, the gateway doing all of the heavy lifting that our future, glorious future of APIs will need and the marketplace sitting in the background just giving users a pretty front end. We had an identity server which would allow us to do that, um, access and authentication a little bit better, which would allow us to um, manage users a little bit more easily and with a little bit more granularity. An enterprise integrator didn't even change, we just upgraded the version. This, from what we had before, barely a change. Um, and then once we moved into year three, the whole thing was going to be made high availability, it was going to be moved to high availability. So it just meant adding those same servers again. Easy peasy. Or, as they say, difficult, difficult. Because, in fact, what we learned was that we got through phase one somewhat by the skin of our teeth. We had a working solution, but we didn't have a deep knowledge of what that solution was doing and how it was integrating. So all of those problems we had um, with our legacy systems, with the way that you have to integrate with the place, as difficult and as heterogeneous as UCL, um, they were still lurking there under the surface. So when we tried to move things around a little bit, we'd actually surfaced a number of brittle connections again, a number of hidden complexities. And the thing that we did um, to change, the thing that made the biggest difference for us as we were going through this journey, and probably the reason that we were invited here to do this talk, is that we asked WSO2 to help us. So we went to WSO2 directly um, as we were going through phase two because the internal conversations we were having and the reading of documents on the website weren't really giving us a deep understanding, a deep enough understanding of how we got something as simple as WSO2 that you can download off the website, unzip on your hard drive, and start up and you've got a working system, how you can turn that into something that works in the kind of messy enterprise that we've got at UCL. So we called WSO2 and things turned around reasonably quickly because we were able to start having some quite complicated and in-depth complications, but those gave us a much more concrete understanding of the, um, 
architecture that we were going to need. So we were able to answer questions about how we were doing database integration, about why we were using particular user stores when connecting to our um, on-premise Active Directory. And all of this is on-premise, it's worth noting. There's very little that we're doing or had been doing up to now that was in the cloud. And the big problem was that it was a whole bunch of on-premise services that were configured in a bespoke way and had been for years and still had to honor a lot of that um, original complexity. But understanding what WSO2 does and what these products do, and when I say WSO2, I mean the products, at a lower level gave us a much more robust understanding of what we needed to do, of what our architecture needed to be, how we could use and leverage, to uh, throw in a little bit of um, corporate jargon there, some of the um, complexities and the functionality of that service and plug it into what we're trying to do and what we're already doing elsewhere in UCL. And it gave us the confidence to come up with architectures. And the other big decision that we made that really helped was having embedded um, engineers from WSO2 on site. So far, we actually had two phases, as I say, going from two servers to four and from four to eight. Um, we had them on site for two months and six weeks, respectively. Um, and having them on site meant that we could do a lot more troubleshooting as things went wrong, as they inevitably did, that we could change designs as we went along without a lot of back and forth, without a lot of difficulty in um, translating things between people because we had them there. We could draw things quickly up on boards, uh, steel meeting rooms, and we could evolve the designs that we'd originally had into something that would was actually working, which actually worked. And while they were there, because um, they're quite multifaceted and um, all credit to the people that came with us um, on this journey, um, they were able to help us with our API development. They were able to feed into some of our policies and processes around OAuth and around um, implementation guidelines and standards. Um, and they were help, able to give us some of the early proof of concept work, which helped solidify our understanding. Um, and on the back of all of that, once again, hey, we delivered. So this now is um, our API store. You can go and find it. Um, it's serving up an API at the moment. There's, uh, if you go to the UCL website and go to our online module catalog, all the data you see there is being served up by an API in real time as we speak from an application that spent, we spent years deploying. It's not actually, it's cached. So when you go there and see it, it won't be coming from WSO2. But the principle's the same. Somewhere over the course of the evening, it'll pick up the new stuff. Um, but the reason that I've cropped this quite so aggressively is because uh, actually if I expanded it out, this is our only API. And the reason that I can't tell you now how to get your company to the point where it's got a thousand APIs, all cellular and all maximizing leverage on the, in the, blue sky um, outside the box. And why I can't tell you all those things is because we've done one, and we did it kind of at the same time as building the platform, and kind of at the same time as solidifying our thoughts around what an API should be at UCL. And so the reason that this talk was called The Journey to the Start of the Journey is because now that we're here, now that we've gone through all the pain and the blood, sweat, and tears of getting a platform in place, we can start the journey and the blood, sweat, and tears of doing something with it that will actually deliver some change. And so we've got that first API. So um, the project is officially a success. It's closed now. It's written up its lessons learned. A lot of people are very happy. We had a small party. Um, and now we've got a new uh, project, which is our API development project. The first year, last year, we spent a lot of time, like I say, I did a lot around, um, we did a lot around developing an API service. We did some principles and some policies, but all of that was in the void. We didn't know what APIs really looked like at UCL. We didn't even have API developers. We've got some of those at the back of the room now. And we didn't know how we were going to use Agile to um, deliver those things. So those principles and policies, the main thing we need to understand about them as we move through the next year is that they're up for grabs, that they should still be avail available to be evolved that we shouldn't be too stuck in what came before. We should learn as we go through the next um, couple of years. And if you go back to slide three, we've got 100 departments, none of whom want us to say, we're going to stop all of our development. We're going to develop 100 APIs for the next year. And then we're going to spend the year after that moving all of our current services to use those APIs with no other value being delivered to you. So anything you want us to do, it's going to have to wait because we're going microservice. Instead, we need to choose our battles. We need to choose the next API as the one that delivers the next, 
the most value to the customer. So if you've got a project that's delivering something to you, that's where we need to start looking at delivering APIs. If you've got, and I'm going to say a piece of legacy technology that's on its way out, but that's most of our technology. So if there's something in particular that's looking to have a refresh, that's where we should start to see if it can move to APIs. Um, but at the same time, we need a strategy and a roadmap. So we've created a roadmap of what we need to tackle, the best next API to deliver, the thing that's going to perhaps give us that um, value, um, and a strategy around it. So for the rest of the department, that says we need to start looking at having API first as our integration strategy. But at the same time, those things need to be flexible and they need to see where the current takes us. As I say, we've got dozens of initiatives trying to change the way that ISD does work. And so we need to find a way to make sure those strategies and roadmaps are able to follow the uh, direction of um, ISD. So while I think the part of the brief was to tell you how to do agile-based API first delivery, all I can tell you is that we aren't sure either. We've started the journey, we've got an idea of where we want to go next, and we've spent the last couple of weeks perhaps pulling some of those boxes together, but we've got a long way to go. Maybe if we're invited back next year, which I'm assuming we won't be, um, <laughs> this presentation will be a lot further down the line. Um, the last thing I want to do, though, is uh, show you what is actually, so we spent three years delivering um, an API platform. It took a lot of people a lot of time. But actually, the thing that everybody loves most in ISD about that project is this slide here that one of our architects created, which is called Seven Steps to an Enterprise API. And basically, back when we were Waterfall, which was however many days ago, um, we decided that the thing that we needed to do to create an API was first understand the data architecture, the data landscape, understand what the integration patterns that would need to be fulfilled are, understand what our um, core um, source systems are, and then wrap it in governance. So make sure that we're not duplicating things, that when we create something, it's reusable, um, to come up with definitions that ensure that we're Max, we're using business language rather than relying on what systems call things, and then move into that implementation so we have low-level designs so that we're reusing components as much as possible, that we're doing transition and ensuring that support's there. And the idea was that we would just continue to roll through these steps. And this seven-step process, which is the phrase that we use most whenever we talk about APIs, we're doing an API, where are we in the seven-step process? We're already ripping this up because it is horribly waterfall and we're super agile now. So we can't do this step after step, but the concepts are still there. Understanding where this API fits in the wider landscape, understanding what integration patterns it's going to be part of, understanding what its boundaries are, where the next API starts and where this one ends, understanding when you're doing a simple API that covers just a single concept, and when you need a more complicated, multifaceted API, which will deliver the most value to an end user, and then rolling through those implementation steps, building up a backlog, a catalog of reusable components in something like um, ESB and DSS, which is what well, ESB especially, which is what we're using. You can build up that catalog of components that you can reuse, the same error handling techniques, the same response codes, and just using this process iteratively through whatever methodology to um, ensure that you're continually focused on what you're trying to do with your APIs. And this process, however irrelevant it is in the bright future, um, is still one of the things that came out of that project that's perhaps the most colorfully concrete.